everyone, and welcome to our presentation on the social service workforce strengthening amid COVID-19 uh, in Bangladesh. This is a presentation by UNICEF Bangladesh and the Department of Social Services. I'd like to thank my colleague Jamila Akhtar, who was instrumental in developing this presentation, but also uh, has led this pillar of work within my team. My name is Natalie McCauley, and I'm the Chief of Child Protection for UNICEF Bangladesh. So during uh, COVID, we've learnt a lot about our social service workforce very quickly, but I want to give you an overview of what it looked like before. We really did need to strengthen the social service workforce before COVID. Social work and casework was not considered critical and life-saving. I think we all know that it is, but it, we've certainly demonstrated that through COVID by saving thousands of children through the process of social work and casework. Uh, we had one social worker for every 100,000 children, not ideal. These social workers also not necessarily qualified in child protection area or social work either. There's more than a million children still living on the streets in Bangladesh. We have tens of thousands of children in institutions and detention facilities. We don't have a formalised foster care system or a formal system of alternative care. We need around 80 to 85,000 um, social service workforce professionals and currently just got over 3,000. The capacity and needs are high at the community to tertiary level of the system and within uh, COVID itself some of the areas we quickly identified were child helpline needed to be expanded as the calls were coming in, field-based social workers needed to be increased and those working in institutions and places of detention we really needed to increase our social workers there. For child protection concerns more broadly within COVID we had a mix that came out last year and we found that 89 percent of children were living in houses that used physical violence and violent discipline and this amounted to 45 million children being locked down in homes that use this type of violent discipline. One of the surveys that was done, an estimated 42% of the respondents said that they were increasing the beating of their children. So there was an increase in use of this violent discipline during the lockdown. Child Helpline had four times the amount of calls. We've had a year's worth of calls, nearly 100,000 worth of calls in the last four months. And this doesn't look like it's significantly reducing, even though across April it's significantly reduced, but now it's increasing again. Increasing media reports have shown that the child deaths uh, via extreme acts of abuse are also increasing. We saw that birth registration was largely stopped during the lockdown. This is now um, restarted, but this was a huge concern and now there's a backlog. We've reached over 37 million people with messaging and we reach them every single month. So it's quite a large number and it's we're lucky because UNICEF in Bangladesh has a 45 million reach across its social media platforms. Um, and we've been having increasing concerns on psychosocial impacts of this emergency. And I know that that is something that is being seen across the health sector and the social welfare workforces across the globe. Information from our social service workforce itself highlights that there's limited locations for women and children to flee if they need to escape from violence. And, and this has been an increasing concern for us, obviously, because the only way people can ask for help really is via phone call, um, perhaps email if they can get access to the internet. So this has been a large issue. We're, we've had a number of months of lockdown, but we've also going into a number of months where there's been little movement. And in the conservative society, this can mean that this can be genderized with women and children being inside their houses more. And we also had concerns around the children in overcrowded detention facilities and we needed to urgently advocate for them to, to be released. So our approach more broadly was to ensure that social workers are seen as essential, critical and life-saving. This is still ongoing. We wanted to increase the number of social workers to assist on the child helpline in the call centre, increase the number of social workers more broadly in urban and field locations increase the number of social workers in institutions and places of detention, develop lots of guidance and technical support documents and thankfully at the global level via the Alliance there was a lot of support in this regard and we were able to, to use a lot of those materials, conduct online learning and training including supervision and coaching 
increase IT support for online follow-up and call centre, so virtual approaches. And we supplied also our social workers and social service workforce with a lot of PPE. This was one of the flyers that was created and this is one of the promotional sort of materials around social workers. Look, Listen and Link is, is one of the key uh, capacity and coaching supports that we're giving to our social workers and social service workforce right now. Uh, we also have some hashtags that we use that are used globally, but uh, It Starts With Me is more of a localised one because we're using a lot of social media and online platforms. Further to this, our approach also included bi-weekly case conference calls with social workers and child welfare boards in each area. This continues. Virtual courts were activated for access to justice and making sure that we could get children released. We had weekly capacity and coaching calls with social workers. This continues. There's been a document series based on um, these assessed gaps and active case identification via different sectors and outreach was also very critical. Referral pathways is something that we continue to focus on in that regard because we really want to get the cases early rather than the responsive approach, which is what we've been doing um, prior to COVID and even during COVID. Um, and this also relates to, you know, the updating of the referral pathways. Some of the guidance series that you can see is all here. It's based around alternative care or how to work with families in the community. Then you'll see the familiar screenshot of Zoom calls. Some of the lessons learned involve around the absence or the shortage of virtual infrastructure. Um, we hadn't really maximised or used innovation as a central component. I think we tried, but I don't think we were all prepared for the level of new materials and, and new ways of working that we could have perhaps maximised even before COVID. And child protection case workers were not equipped for that either. We needed to give more investment for deploying child protection social workers um, and social service workers at the community level to ensure that emergency protection services were available. Um, child protection social work and outreach activities are vital for women and children. I know I said that at the start and I think the development nature of systems building has been obvious for many many years within child protection but it's also a preparedness necessity for humanitarian action and I think we've been able to show that and demonstrate that in this emergency. Some of the next steps, we want to continue with the social service workforce strengthening uh, through capacity building, but also increases in human resources. We can want to keep strengthening this capacity building and particularly the capacity of the community-based systems increase the messaging on the importance of the social service workforce. I think that's something we can continue to do globally, regionally, and also at the country level. Enhance access to justice measures linking with social service workforce. Reduce the numbers of children in institutions. This is something we're going to continue to focus on. Create service hubs in urban areas for families living on the street. We've already started to do this, creating child protection service hub. Increase our messaging on prevention and mitigating harmful practices through the social service workforce, strengthening online systems of case management and referral, engaging adolescents and the child rights facilitators to identify vulnerable adolescents and refer them, um, and obviously coordination of the child protection cluster at the national level and the subsectors at Cox's level to maximise non-government social service workforce. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you got something out of this presentation.